Welcome everybody to Research and Innovation Week 3MT Graduate Competition. We welcome all of our presenters, judges, as well as exhibitors to our, our presentation today. The three minute thesis or 3MT competition challenges research-based graduate students to articulate the impact and breadth of their research in a three minute presentation using just one static PowerPoint slide. The three minute thesis was first established in 2008 by the University of Queensland as a research communication competition that cultivates students' presentation and communication skills and provides them with an invaluable networking opportunity. Since 2011, the popularity of the competition has increased and 3MT competitions are now held in over 600 universities and instructions across 65 countries worldwide. Here at Lakehead, I believe this is going to be our fifth year doing a 3MT competition. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our judges. We have Dr. Rhonda Dubeck, Coordinator of the Instructional Development, Dr. Sh Chandra Shahi, Dean of Graduate Studies, and Dr. Batia Stoller, Vice President, Research and Graduate Studies. We're gonna move along into our presenters, and I will announce our first presenter, Farnia Destonian, Supervisor is Lila Paxhead, and the title of her presentation is Drug Particles, Deposition, and Mouth Throat Geometry, via PMDI inhalers, CFD study. Breathing in comfort become one of our prior issue in the recent year and we all suffer. Now just imagine so many people struggling in a daily life because of respiratory diseases such as asthma and COPD. These patients having a hard time breathing because of the inflation inside the air throat make it narrower and they having a hard time for breathing. So uh, these diseases make it hard for them in, a, in contacting with the air pollution or even the cold weather. And one of the common devices for the treatment is inhaler. Inhalers are the small puffer as you may recall. Since the drug causing the systematic diseases on the mouse skin, the inhalation is the best way to use it. However, these devices create a couple of issues to deal with. One of them is inhalers are very patient dependent. It means patient must follow the instruction very accurately for high efficiency. For example, they have to shake well the inhaler before the using and in a steady way, they have to inhale the drug, hold the breath for 10 seconds, and then the drug will reach the lung. The other issues that we come across uh, with using the inhaler is aerosol drugs are polydispersed, which means the fine and large particles exist in a spray. So the fact is the particles are smaller than five micrometer are the one who deliver to the lung. However, if you make it the way that all particles become smaller than the five micrometer, but mostly there is a higher chance that all of the particles mostly actually exist, uh, exist the system through the nose by the exhalation. So what we do need is the acceptable spectrum of the drugs in our spray. So, what we do need to do it is the, to study about the drug behavior after actuation. So there are a couple of replicas of upper respiratory tract in, um, in this industry as well for the experimental tool. So as a chemical engineer, we build a bridge between uh, the medical and mechanical engineering. So the thing is that numerical method that what we do in our lab is filling the gap of the experimental limitation and we model and simulate the respiratory tract and the aerosol plume as well and one of the, our important advantages for our investigate is that we can um, predict the, each particle behavior on a different circumstances of truth in a different situation so our study will help the patients to access to the better inhaler and higher efficiency. Thank you. Hi, Farnia, thank you. I'm going to take one moment to pause and make sure that we're all working okay. Jenny, are we live on Feedloop? Yes, you are. We have. 
we have four speaker views up and uh, they're all all live on feed loop. Okay. Sarah, are we still concerned? Please continue. Thank you. I would like to introduce our next presenter, Taylor Bilot, whose supervisor is Jessica Metcalf, and whose title is Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? Stable Isotope Variability in Boreal Animal Tissues. Fans of Greek mythology may recall Prometheus's trick at Mekon, in which the Titan fool Zeus into choosing a bundle of ox's bones and gristle as a divine offering while humans kept the meat. From then on, Greeks enjoyed protein-packed provisions and piously tossed bones into the pyro. Though human ourselves, bioarchaeologists can sympathize with Zeus because time preserves little more than bones as evidence of an animal's existence. Bones can tell a story, but biochemistry helps us read between the lines. Carbon, nitrogen, sulfur are three elements that make up the structural units of the body. Proteins. Living things get the protein blocks to make proteins from food and can then form cells, tissues, and organs. So you really are what you eat. Sometimes atoms of an element are slightly heavier or lighter than normal, and we call these different forms isotopes. Relative amounts of isotopes, like carbon-13, nitrogen-15, and sulfur-34 in a material, will tell us about the individual's diet and metabolic processes. Bones grow slowly, so they show a record of average diet over years to decades, while soft tissues recycle constantly and have very different metabolic needs. So their isotopes reflect a more recent diet, limited by habitat and seasonability, giving the original organisms spatial and temporal context. But even Cerberus can't eat bones. Animals consume muscle, organs, and connective tissues. So we collected specimens of animal species historically common to boreal regions. We will sample from edible organs like muscle groups, liver, and kidney, as well as bones, skin, and hair, measuring how isotopes vary between them, and most importantly, how those signatures in meat differ from what would be left behind for archaeologists, the bones. This approach differs from current research because most intertissue projects compare either bone to skin or only soft tissues to each other with little application to archaeology. Also, these studies largely concern fish, domestic animals, and lab rats, neglecting native species relevant to pre-colonial North America. Bones are valuable because they preserve isotopic signatures well over time, but the meat of the matter is that diet is naturally seasonal and the food log in bone collagen will not reflect a consumer's fluctuating diet that's vital for understanding ecosystem dynamics. Measuring how those signatures and soft tissues differ from bones will provide insight into the seasonal diets of these animals and how well we can expect archaeological remains of those species to reflect their place in the food web. This is really valuable for biodiversity and conservation efforts because comparing modern bone to archaeological bones from the same region and species can tell us about how those food webs may have changed over time, providing a new way to understand human impact on ecosystems. Zeus may have been eating with his eyes, but everyone else eats with their isotopes. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Our next presenter is Will Burton. Supervisor is David Greenwood, and the title is How Should We Live Here? Reforming Curriculum in Winnipeg for the Anthropocene. We are living in the Anthropocene, the great acceleration of capitalism and consumption that followed World War II. Powered by the extraction of natural resources that terraforms the planet and the burning of fossil fuels, which changes the chemistry of the biosphere, the Anthropocene demarcates a planet which has been geologically altered by humankind. A critical component of the Anthropocene is climate change. The most recent IPCC reports claim without qualification that we have now moved far beyond reversing atmospheric carbon particles back to pre-industrial levels and are now squarely in the territory of mitigating from very bad to bad climate futures. Education is often determined as the solution to wider societal problems, but what if education itself is the problem and directed humans in the great acceleration that initiated the Anthropocene and has continued to support unsustainable economic growth since. In his 1987 book, Culture of Denial, Chet Bowers argued that many of our environmental problems were tied directly to miseducation, 
and the divorce of humans from the natural world. Education in its present form, Bowers claimed, was a barrier rather than a guide towards living in healthy, happy, and ecologically sustainable communities. Though written 30 years ago, the curriculum that guides instruction today has not altered significantly. How can or should education respond to the Anthropocene? The thesis that I will advance is that neither society as a whole nor education as an institution is currently prepared to deal with the present and future climate crisis and life in the Anthropocene. This is no exception in my hometown of Winnipeg, Manitoba. My primary research question then is, what would a Manitoba curriculum that addressed the challenges of climate change head on look like? What knowledge, skills and attributes in grades nine through 12 Manitoba public education will support climate change mitigation and adaptation in Winnipeg? Two research methods will drive my work towards recommendations. First, I'll begin with a content analysis of policy documents on what the impacts of climate change will be for the city of Winnipeg, including the most recent IPCC reports and a range of policy documents from the city of Winnipeg. Second, I will conduct a series of semi-structured interviews with climate experts, activists, politicians, as well as classroom teachers engaged in climate change education in the Metro Winnipeg region. If the aim of K-12 public education is to prepare students to fully participate in society, then they must be prepared to reckon with the impacts of the climate emergency. We must do this for ourselves and our community to not only survive, but thrive in the future. With changes in curriculum, graduates of Winnipeg high schools will have learned how to live, equipped with the knowledge, attitudes, and actions to be able to become navigators of the Anthropocene. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Our next presenter is Alankrit Mishra, Supervisor Garima Bajwa, Enhancing Machine Perception Using Human Cognitive Abilities. Machines have been a part of our lives since the early stages of human civilization. And now they have kind of become our best friend since the innovation of computers in 20th century, followed by the era of artificial intelligence. It made our life so much simpler when we began to use smart technologies to automate return route operations. They are really good, in fact, better than us at something such as arithmetic and precision. However, machine perception is still an evolving domain because of the fundamental building blocks of machine intelligence is binary. Their decisions are precise, but not intuitive. Wouldn't it be am amazing your, if your virtual assistant could assume a basic notion based on the con context of your inquiry you asked instead of stating, I am sorry, but I could not find what you are looking for in, on the internet human cognitive ability to construct a general understanding of artifacts, especially the new ones, makes us significantly more efficient than machine perception. We may argue that in this data-driven age, we can train AI with ever-increasing volumes of information, digital information, but at what cost? Time and memory? What if we can transfer cognitive abilities of human beings of generalization to machine learning? This is where my research comes into picture. We now have the ability to capture certain aspects of human consciousness thanks to the advancement in brain-computer interfaces such as EEG brainwave signals. Moreover, studies have indicated these signals include critical information about how human brain receives stimuli such as audiovisual. The idea here is to extract these features from the BCI records and feed them to the machine learning models like deep neural networks. It will help the AI understand how we perceive stimuli. Consider it as a catalyst to the training of the machines. The purpose of my thesis is to decrease the work required to train a computer as it uses a vast quantity of data. Instead, we may they may learn how we view things as human, make intuitive judgments on the go, and utilize them to generalize a baby step towards a better future. That's my three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is Amen Hazard's Hazard, Hazard Day. Supervisor is Leila Paxson, and the title is Better Inhaler, Better Life. Hello, 
when you're healthy, your airways are clear. Air can easily flow in and out of your lungs. So what could possibly go wrong? Exposure to various irritants and substances that trigger allergies can trigger signs and symptoms of asthma too. Uh, like tobacco smoke, outdoor air pollution, even pets. Now, may I ask you to stop breathing for about 30 seconds? When an asthma attack begins, the smooth muscles around the outside of the air tubes may tighten. The airways in the lungs become inflamed and swollen, and with the release of thick mucus, they will be further blocked. And what you are experiencing now is virtually the same, a patient with a severe asthma attack foot. Now you can take a deep breath and enjoy your healthy lungs. To help such patients, the right amount of drug should be deposited in their airways to help the muscles stretch back. And what is the best way to deliver drug to lungs in terms of minimum side effect and ease of administration? You might have seen them before, inhalers. All you've got to do is to push a button. Among many available devices, soft mist inhalers prove to deliver more drugs into aimed areas. And when I say more, I mean roughly 60% efficiency, which is twice as others such as PMDIs and VPS. Also, other inhalers deliver the same amount of drug at higher cost and utilize HFC propellant, which have a global warming potential about 100 to more than 3000 times worse than carbon dioxide. In my research, I will try to maximize this device's efficiency to empirical and numerical studies by taking into account factors like thermodynamics of flow and the structural characteristics of the inhaler itself to come up with a new patentable add-on for the old SMRs. My goal is to deliver a therapeutic mean which costs less for patients and is environmentally friendly and ultimately decrease the possibility of a six digit figure to be the number of the people who suffered from asthma or COPD somewhere in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is Meghdi Alanani, Supervisor is Ahmed Al-Lashir. Title is Towards Efficient Future Housing Against Climate Impact. Hello, everyone. However, I'm not a mind reader, but there is a question I'm pretty sure that one day it popped up in your minds, which is, how long should I work in order to buy a house? I cannot answer this question, but I can help in making the answer easier. I'm Magda Alanani, and my research is tackling the problem of housing. In Canada, for example, at least 100,000 new houses should have been built since 2016. The problem is not only about the number of houses that should be provided, but it's also about the methodology of designing and building these houses. Noting that the number of climate-related natural disasters increased in the last three decades, especially extreme wind events. These climate changes require an increase in the resiliency of the residential buildings, which increases the cost of construction and leads to a further increase in the cost of housing. The main goal of my research is to make housing more affordable without compromising their safety against extreme loading events especially when, through an innovative methodology called the structured topology optimization, which means finding the best distribution of materials within a design domain. To explain more, let me show you our traditional design methodology and how I'm going to develop it. The process is similar to the Jenga game. You are given a limited number of blocks, which is our structural material resources. And your objective is to get the tallest possible structure. Through the game, the constraints are to avoid failure and to follow the game rules, which is the same thing in our design process. We are trying to follow our code regulations and to avoid failure due to various loading, especially extreme wind events. Through this design process, numerous iterations can be done to reach a satisfactory solution that complies with the serviceability requirements. However, these solutions cannot be guaranteed to fit the most optimum solution. So instead of the trial and error iterations, I developed an algorithm that will rely on computer minds. I will let the computer use the, the knowledge that we have to exceed our limits. It's a systematic procedure that makes use of artificial intelligence to help us find not only a better configuration, but the best configuration of our Jenga blocks within the building's layout. Once incorporated into construction practice, 
my approach will provide more optimized and cost-effective structures. Also, it will reduce the embodied carbon by minimizing the amount of material used for buildings without compromising or sacrificing the other aspects of design. Thanks. Thank you. Our next presenter is Michael Duncan. Supervisor is Matthew Tesheri. And title of the presentation is Investigating Scaling Patterns in Hominin Crania. So it's not letting me start my video, but I'll just present anyway. Um, so I, Michael Duncan, am going to be explaining to you why I've been investigating scaling patterns in fossil human crania with special attention to Homo floresiensis. Now, Homo floresiensis is a small-bodied, small-brained uh, uh, hominin that was discovered on the Indonesian island of Flores. The biological relationship of Homo floresiensis to modern humans, that is Homo sapiens, and other extinct species of humans, commonly referred to hominins, is a major question uh, within human evolutionary research. Currently, there's an intense debate surrounding whether Homo floresiensis is an island dwarf descendant of Asian Homo erectus or the descendant of a small bodied, small brained hominin such as Homo habilis. Generally, arguments in favor of the Homo Asian Homo erectus ancestry hypothesis have relied on morphological comparisons of hominin crania. More specifically, these arguments claim that Homo floresiensis has an absolutely and relatively small face like that of modern humans and Asian Homo erectus. However, these previous analyses have not formally explored the scaling relationships of the face and other cranial elements of Homo floresiensis. So what I do here is I'm showing how facial heights scale with cranial length. The reason why I do it against cranial length is because cranial length is a strong predictor of overall cranial size. And I'm, and I'm putting this in a comparative sample of hominids. The major axis regression that is shown here is describing the scaling pattern in modern humans. That is the pink circles and the feet and the blue circles with the line drawn through them. So it's interesting that Asian Homo erectus, such as Dolly, and other fossil hominin species that have large brains, such as Neanderthals, have relatively small faces for their neurocranial size. And, that, and if you'll observe here, most of these fossils which have large brains and small faces fall within the range of modern humans. However, in contrast, Homo floresiensis actually shows to have a relatively large face for its cranial size and is more similar to other members attributed to early Homo and even some Australopithecines. So, what this data is suggesting is that the ancestry of Homo floresiensis lies closer with small-bodied, small-brained species of Homo rather than Asian Homo erectus, which has shown a more derived condition of facial reduction. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michael. Our next presenter is Courtney Ferris. Supervisor is Dr. Marina Yulanova. And the title is Neutrophils and the Interface Between Innate and Adaptive Immunity in Response to Hemophilus Influenza. Hi. The purpose of my research is to elucidate the immune mechanisms of defense against the import important human bacterial pathogen, Haemophilus Influenza, otherwise known as HI. You probably haven't heard of Haemophilus Influenza, but you've probably been mildly infected with it. It does not cause the flu, as the name suggests, but rather causes the common ear infection. However, in some cases, it can cause severe invasive disease. Type A, or HIA, is a specific strain of HI that has a high infection rate in nearby indigenous communities. However, a vaccine is not available for type A, and much is still unknown about the immune response immune response to HIA. Neutrophils are the most abundant immune cell in our body with many functions. When a pathogen is detected by neutrophils, two main things will initially happen. First, the bacteria will likely be engulfed by neutrophils. Second, the neutrophils will be activated, sending signals to other immune players, kind of like a call for backup. You could say that our immune system is like a network and neutrophils are at the forefront, 
being the first to detect the pathogen and send signals to other immune cells. Recently, novel and fascinating roles of neutrophils have been uncovered, including their role in activating the adaptive immune response despite being an innate immune cell. My research is focused on determining if neutrophils can activate the innate and adaptive immune systems in response to HIA. I decided to investigate this in two ways. First, I can directly measure how many bacteria are killed to determine if neutrophils have varying ability to kill HIA clinical isolates. Second, I can measure changes in surface expression and secretion of molecules of interest on the neutrophil itself. My results are still preliminary. However, it seems that the innate immune system is activated and killing of HIA varies depending on both the immune component and individual clinical isolate of HIA present. Secondly, HIA stimulation increases the expression of CD54 and CD89 on neutrophils. These are two surface proteins involved in innate and adaptive crosstalk. With further research, I can determine if this activation is significant and identify additional molecules involved in this response. Discovering exactly how neutrophils react to HIA is an important step in creating vaccines or therapies. It can also redefine neutrophils' role in literature, making it clear that despite years of research on the human immune system, there is still so much we don't know our body is capable of. Thank you, Courtney. Our next presenter is Michael Langstad. Supervisor is Dr. David Greenwood, and the title is Taking Care of the Self Before Taking Care of the Planet, Alternative Education and Expanding Circles of Care. Adage, which states that you can't truly love someone else unless you love yourself. It could be argued that the same might be said for loving the planet. With this in mind, I ask the following questions. How can education embrace the kind kinds of critical self-reflection and complex psychological development necessary for cultivating the self-acceptance and feelings of interconnectivity necessary for providing care for others, including the natural world. Through this presentation, I argue that we as humans must be stewards of ourselves before we can be proper stewards of the planet. Broadly, my research explores the role of education in supporting transformational initiations into adulthood. I'm especially in interested in forms of education for adulthood that place the cultivation of expanding circles of care front and center. In my research, I work with students and teachers at a public alternative school in Western Canada that offers a local option course centered on William Glasser's choice theory, a clinical therapeutic approach to self-knowledge and life change that is based on systems thinking. I used a framework of circles of care to explore the extent to which participants' awareness and empathy expanded outwards towards greater abstraction as a result of their learning choice theory. First, I engaged with participants in conversations of how learning choice theory changed the way that they saw themselves. I followed this with questions about perspective transformation on others in their close social group, the local community, wider society, and the natural world. Both students and teachers spoke of how learning the techniques and especially the language of choice theory enhanced their acceptance of self and increased the empathy they felt for others. In all cases, the participants' circle of care extended to their in-group. In fewer cases, circles of care extended to wider society, and in fewer still to the natural world. Interestingly, based on the qualitative data, the level of abstraction encompassed by the individual circle of care correlated strongly with the amount of experience that the participant had with choice theory. In conclusion, what these findings hint at is the possibility that truly caring about the well-being of the earth relies on cultivating care at less complex levels of abstraction, beginning with the self. On a related note, based on the growing scholarship surrounding the positive psychological impacts of time spent in nature, through expanding one's circle of care to include the natural world, one can better learn to care for themselves. Thus, I theorize that by learning to love oneself, Individuals are more likely to reach the point of having empathy for the natural world, and a positive feedback loop could emerge that continually reinforces care between the individual and the earth. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Michael. Our next presenter is Syed Mohammed, 
Supervisor, supervisors are Dr. Leila Pascat and Dr. Pedram Fatih. Title is Lignin as an Emulsion Stabilizer. In today's world, the society we know that uh, cannot function without oil. Despite all our efforts toward a green future, we are still miles away from total oil independency. This long dependency has brought us closer to the verge of climate instability. And, um, and uh, the signs of which are appearing all over the planet. To overcome this situation and to prevent, um, and to prevent uh, irreversible catastrophes, um, we must act fast and find innovative, reliable solutions. One of these solutions is that uh, finding an alternative for oil, which is sustainable, economically attractive, and um, producible in a larger scale. This is the main focus of our research in the Green Processes Research Center at Lakehead University. Lignin is an uh, organic polymer with similar properties to oil, which is abundantly available from the residual of paper and biotonal industries. Annually, 100 million tons of lignin burned across the world, a compound that could be used to produce numerous products uh, such, as, um, uh, such as emulsifiers. And now what's the problem with lignin? The problem with lignin is that it is in solid form, so it has to be converted to liquid in order to be usable. Um, for this purpose, we graph hydrophilic uh, groups to the structure of lignin so that in the end, we have a water-soluble structure that has a distinctive proper property. Um, it, has a, a hydrophilic, uh, it has a hydrophilic head that attracts uh, molecules such as water and a hydrophobic uh, tail that attracts uh, molecules such as oil, non-polar molecules such as oil. And um, materials with this property are called surfactants. Surfactants um, are typically manufactured using um, chemically dri chemical derived and petroleum-based uh, compounds. And um, one of the applications of surfactants is um, using uh, use as uh, as an emulsion as stabilizers emulsions are made up of two immiscible liquids uh, for example oil in water emulsions where uh, in addition to oil and water um, an extra component um, which is the surfactant uh, is required to keep the emulsion stable and uh, emulsions are used in many products uh, in the food cosmetic and pharmaceutical industries so if we could uh, produce emulsions um, with lignin-based emulsifiers instead of um, oil-based surfactants. And not only we, uh, we have uh, created a value-added byproduct, um, um, uh, not only we have uh, created a value-added byproduct, um, but uh, we have made a huge step for the green future um, and uh, oil-free oil work. Thank you. Thank you, Saeed. Our next presenter is Nicole Lee. Supervisor is Dr. Taryn Klarner. And the title of her presentation is Exploring the Rehabilitative and Exercise Experience in Stroke Recovery Among Adults Living in Thunder Bay. I want to help those who have had a stroke walk a smoother pathway to rehabilitation and exercise, not by fixing their problems, but by understanding what they are. We as a community need to understand that our health and the health of our environment are intertwined. Our resilience, well-being, and nutrition are all linked to the food we eat, the water we drink, and the air we breathe. If we can focus on recovering the health of individuals who have had a stroke, they in turn can focus on recovering the health of our planet. In Canada, there are hundreds of thousands of individuals living with the effects from a stroke. Here in Ontario, within the next 30 minutes, one new stroke will occur. The same goes for here in Thunder Bay. We have an aging population where the prevalence of stroke is quite evident. As you can see here in my photo, the pathway to stroke rehabilitation is quite complex. It starts with the stroke, which then leads to different types of lifelong complications. Regardless of the complication, rehabilitation is necessary in order to help the individual find a new sense of independence. Specifically, exercise is one type of rehabilitation that can help mitigate some of these effects after a stroke. Here in Thunder Bay, stroke survivors have more barriers to exercise and rehabilitation, simply due to their location of living. 
It has been seen that readmission rates are higher for those living in Thunder Bay who have had a stroke in comparison to those living in Southern Ontario. This is due to the less readily available and limited access to resources and services found in Thunder Bay. In the summer of 2021, I completed a pilot project for my master's thesis, looking into the experience of those who have had a stroke living in Thunder Bay through a semi-structured interview and a survey. The results concluded that barriers to rehabilitation revolved around their own perceived ability and lack of motivation, however I identified many facilitators to participating in rehabilitation and exercise. In the surveys, this was supported, however participants' quality of life scores were low. So this implicated that more research needs to be done to gain a comprehensive summary of one's rehabilitative experiences here in Thunder Bay, because I could not conclude why the participants were experiencing those barriers and the facilitators and how it impacted them. Therefore, this paved the way for the purpose of my master's thesis, which is to explore the rehabilitative and exercise experiences among those living in Thunder Bay using just semi-structured interviews. I'm going to gather information about their life after stroke and rehabilitation experiences, barriers and facilitators they have faced, and how the COVID-19 pandemic may have impacted them to give them the voice they deserve to share their experiences. From here, it is hoped that by exploring stroke survivors' experience, it can give researchers and health care providers the tools to improve their care and address any concerns to make it easier to participate in exercise and rehabilitation. If more stroke survivors begin to partake in exercise and rehabilitation, they can begin to choose options like active transport to help reduce the amount of carbon emissions in our environment. From here, through understanding their experiences, I will help stroke survivors walk a smoother pathway to rehabilitation, both literally and figuratively. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole. Our next presenter is Shai Lee. Supervisor is Dr. Scott Hamilton. And the title of her presentation is Comparative Analysis of Tea Culture in China, Britain, and Japan between the 16th to the 19th centuries. Although you cannot see what it is in Asia, I don't want you to guess. I just want to emphasize that comparing human history, my thesis is tiny, like this tea leaf on the slide. However, because of tea culture, this tiny tea leaf has changed the history and it became the most popular beverage in the world. Why it would happen, how it would have happened, and what was the impact on human beings? My thesis focuses on this topic to compare three tea cultures in China, Britain, and Japan during the 16th to 19th century. China, where tea culture originated, was an obvious choice. Why did I choose Japan and Britain? The former has innovated Chinese tea culture into Japanese tea ceremony. It can represent how tea culture diffused from China to East country. The latter has created an English opportunity tea ratio to conquer the world, which included colonialism and imperialism. I use materials and archives to represent and compare three tea ratios to reveal how tea culture diffused from China to the whole world. My expertise in Asian Chinese tea writings, learning in Japan and living in Canada can help me to collect and understand the primary resources. The research will provide systematic tea cultural diffusion in these three countries. The differentiation of tea culture from the originated country, China, to Japan and Britain can reflect the real historical world of human beings in Eastern and Western countries. Finally, I want to tell you, don't think you are weak as well as the tea leaf on the slide. Our behavior may change the history of the tea culture. Hope we can learn from tea culture history to better our world. Thank you. Thank you, Shai. The next presenter is Regda El Chalabi, 
supervisor is Dr. Amid El Shir, and the title of her presentation is Aerodynamic Optimization of Houses to Minimize Climate Impact. Hello. Have you heard about the tornado in Barrie in southern Ontario last summer? This tornado have left a path of destruction of over five kilometers long and 100 meters wide, resulting in over eight, 10 people injured and causing over 8 million of insured losses alone, mostly impacting low-rise building, uh, low buildings. We memorize this event because it's not common in Canada to witness uh, severe wind uh, damages or events in Canada. So the question is now why we are witnessing higher frequency and severe intensity of these wind events that are inducing severe damages to the low rise building structure. The answer would be could be a combination between both the aging infrastructure and the climate change. And here, Northern Canadian territories, it is warming three times faster than the world. Well, and on top of that, residential buildings all over Canada occupies over 50% all over Canada. Therefore, these both factors put an urgency to this research to propose a design for the low-rise building so we have a more resilient uh, buildings uh, during wind events. So what happens during the wind event, damages to the houses start from the roof. These, the, the roof, part, parts of the roof, which is a base, start with the uh, shingles and tiles, may get dislodged and therefore pose a hazard, flying hazard debris around to the life and the neighboring buildings. And on top of that, these openings into the roof of, into the roofs, they may lead to water intrusions and therefore interior damages. To protect, therefore, the roof of the low-rise building that is considered the main part that keeps the building intact during wind events, I am proposing in my research to adding an aerodynamic mitigation technique, which is basically an architectural features that can be retrofitted to an existing building. They're easily engineered and they basically placed at the other locations, the edges and the corner, where they experience commonly the damages during wind events. Uh, and this is similarly like uh, other uh, elements that can be added to aeroplanes. If we have noticed the wings of the aeroplanes, there are components added to these wings, so they reduce the pressure during takeoff and landing, uh, uh, so, so they can take off the aeroplane, take off and land safely. This aerodynamic mitigation technique Later on, I, am I will be link linking them to an optimization procedure so we can find the perfect optimal configuration for these, uh, for, these for these aerodynamic mitigation technique so we can reduce these forces impacting the roof leading to damages to the maximum and also to accommodate the varieties and complexities of roof design all over Canada. So ultimately, my goal is not only to save lives during wind events, but also to reduce the economic burdens on communities and cities for the generations to come. This is my 3MT. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Regda. And our final presentation of the 3MT competition is Saba Kodavanda Care. Supervisor is Dr. Pedram Fatih. And the title of her presentation is Phosphorylated Lingen Aerogel as a Thermal Insulation. Thank you. Hello and welcome everybody. Energy conservation is the effort to use less energy, which can be achieved by using energy efficiently. Ecosufficiency is a part of the concept of saving energy. Saving energy can reduce air and water pollution and conserve natural resources, which creates a healthier living environment for people everywhere. Thermal insulation is a great solution to reduce energy consumption by preventing heat gain or loss through the building envelope. Incorporating it in every element of building, like walls, roofs, and floors, we can use the required energy more efficiently and effectively without affecting our comfort. Controlling the three heat transfer method, like conduction, convection, and radiation, is the way to save energy. As a result, materials with low thermal conductivity are becoming the perfect candidate for thermal insulations. Among those, 3D porous aerogel are gaining more attention worldwide because of their lightweight, 
high porosity, low material density, large surface area, and low conductivity. Airy microscopic pores make up 97% of aerogel's volume. This air has very little room to move, inhibiting convection and conduction. This characteristic makes aerogel the world's least density solid and most effective thermal insulator. As a result, thermal insulating aerogel made of petroleum residue can be found in the market. This material has its limitation. Not only do they contribute to the world's solid waste, but also flammable, flammability is a challenge. This thesis aims to replace those materials with bio options such as lignin. Lignin is proven to be a perfect candidate, given the fact that it's a second abandoned biopolymer with a 3D structure and water resistance. Modification of lignin with phosphor containing reagent can further improve thermal stability and flame retardant properties. Production, production of lignin from lignin via cross linking is feasible because of mentioned properties. When phosphorus is heated, it will react and produce a polymeric form of phosphoric acid. This acid causes a char layer which shields the material from oxygen and prevents the formation of flammable gases. We can save energy for our future by adapting green approaches. Thank you so much. Thank you, Saba. At this time, our judges are going to convene in a separate meeting in order to discuss who the winners of the 3MT competition will be. We will re reconvene here at 525, so I invite everybody to take a break and then come back for 525 when we will announce the results of today's competition. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I welcome you all back to our 3MT competition and to learn the results. I'm just going to give people a few seconds because we were a little bit delayed, so I don't want anyone to miss this exciting moment. And I hope we have everybody back with us. So I am going to start with our third place. First, I would like to say thank you to all of our researchers and to all of our graduate students. You did an excellent job, a wonderful presentation. Adapting it to an online model I know is not easy. Uh, we hope to be again, back and live and in person in the coming year, next year, but for this year, we were, we were live and I, I think it is exciting because people all over can see you and it's not just people here in Thunder Bay and, and on our campus, but anyone can join us and watch. So I am gonna start with our third place. And the third place goes to Amin Hadizi, Better Inhaler, Better Life. Congratulations. Thank you. Our second place is going to Meghdi Alani, and the title is Towards Efficient Future Housing Against Climate Impact. Congratulations, Meghdi. Thanks. And our first place is going to Nicole Lee, and the print is very small on my thing here, so I'm just going to grab another little piece of paper here so I can read your title. And the title is Exploring the Rehabilitative and Exercise Experience in Stroke Recovery Among Adults Living in Thunder Bay. Congratulations, Nicole. Thank you. I would like, again, to thank all of your presenters for taking the time to participate in, uh, in Research and Innovation Week and specifically in the 3MT uh, presentation. I wanna thank supervisors for supporting their students and working with them on this research. I want to thank our judges and I just want to thank our general public as well for coming out and viewing this excellent presentation of the 3MT. Thank you to everybody. Take care and have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.